Some people, some people might wonder why we make a big deal about this one called Jesus. You know? They may wonder, why are we making such a big deal about this? Why is it such a big deal to come and worship Him on the day that He rose from the grave? Why is it such a big deal to get out here and reach people with the gospel? Why is it such a big deal that all these things occur? Well, when somebody says something about that, it tells me that they don't have the knowledge of Him, do they? They don't know who He is. They don't know what's coming in the future, do they? Like I hope that each and every one of us do. Jesus made a claim. He made a claim. He made a claim to be someone who had been promised since the beginning of creation. Now this first, the promise was given to all, everyone in the world as it was moving forward. Then it was specifically given to the Jewish people that they might write it down and chronicle the prophecies of this one who was to come over thousands of years. They wrote these things down. It was given to them. The irony of this, though, is when he finally did appear in the New Testament, when Jesus finally showed up upon the scene, it was the Jewish people that rejected him. They didn't see him for who he was. They didn't see his claim as true. Jesus expressed his disappointment about that 2,000 years ago in Israel in Luke 12, 54 through 56. He said also to the people, Jesus did, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway you say, there cometh a shower, and so it is. We do the same thing. We see the dark cloud coming. We say, well, there's a thunderstorm coming. There's a rain coming, right? And when you see the south wind blow, you will say, there will be heat, and it cometh to pass. You look at the things on the earth. You see these different things about weather. Jesus said then, ye hypocrites. Ye can discern the face of the sky and the earth, but how is it that you do not, ye did not discern this time? You don't see when I arrived here upon the scene, you rejected the Savior. How can you not see this after all of your people, after all this time, have sat down and wrote within this book what is the truth of His coming? All these prophecies here, and He is fulfilling them. He is showing them, and they close their eyes. They don't want the knowledge of the truth. Sometimes when we sit in church, we close our eyes and take a nap. We don't want the knowledge of the truth, do we? We don't want the absolute authority of what it is saying. It amazes me that we have a church on every corner around us, right? But if I were to take a survey, a survey out here today of all the uh, different area about who the Messiah is and what that means, most people will not know what that means. Do you know who He is? Do you know the promised one that was to come, that is to come, and will come. See, this whole Bible, this whole message of God to mankind is about the promised one's first, okay, and his second coming. The whole Bible is about that. The whole thing. The Jewish people wrote it, but most of them don't even recognize it. The Jews called him the Messiah. That's a Hebrew. The Greeks called him the Christ. That's in the Greek. And we Christians, what do we call him? We call him Jesus, don't we? We call him by his name because that's who he is. Today we live in a time that can move clearly into the prophesied second visitation of Jesus Christ. There's no doubt in my mind. I mean, uh, in the short time I've lived and in the time I've looked back upon history, there's no better time than now for Jesus to return. Can I tell you that? I mean, at least from where I'm looking at it. There's a prophecy in the Bible. It's called... Gog and Magog. And it talks about a battle that will occur within the Middle East during this time. And it's widely understood that uh, this Gog and this Magog uh, represent Russia and Iran. Did you know that? Did you know that? Attacking Israel in the last days. And now what are we seeing? All this disruption out of Russia. All this disruption out of Iran. Uh, somebody just said Israel was taking in some of the, uh, the Ukrainians into their borders. Folks, do you not see that we live in such a time as this? Do you not see that if you don't tell that lost loved one today about Jesus, you might not have another chance? Do you not see this? Do you not see he could come back at any minute? 
For almost 2,000 years, there was no Israel. Disappeared around A.D. 70. And then miraculously, in 1948, it just appears upon the scene. Never happened in the history of the world. A nation born just like that. And the scriptures prophesied these. If you understand what it's saying, it prophesied this idea that Israel would return. Why would it have to return? Because the book of Revelation references Israel. And after all this time, different Christians were saying, well, that must be metaphorical. It's not literal. It it must be some kind of metaphor for for this or for that. God said, no, it wasn't. Because here's Israel, all right? It's back in 1948. Do you realize how prime things are for his return within the next few moments, if he so be. We never had the technology to provide what's called in the Bible the mark of the beast. Do you know that? I mean, there's ideas they could put tattoos when it was a smaller group of people and all these things. That was kind of outlandish. Today, today, an RFID chip can be implanted under the skin. You can walk in and you can open your door with it. You can put all your personal information within that RFID chip. You can get in there and crank your car just by pushing a button because you have it implanted on you. You can be denied service if you aren't able to connect to the server. The other day, me and my wife, we had a gift card to go eat at some place. We got up there, and there was a, a denial of the connection to the server to prove that there was money on our card. Therefore, we were denied food that day. Thankfully, uh, they gave us a complaint card and said, well, uh, you can have your food free today, right? Because of this. But the server was down. What happens when somebody in power just cuts your name off the server and the server stays on? You don't get food, do you? You don't get your pay, do you? You see how easy the mark of the beast could be implemented today? I don't believe it'll be implemented until I'm gone according to the word of God. But how easy, how easy this could occur today. Not only uh, that, uh, people wondered for uh, all these years. It says, when Jesus returns, every eye shall see them. And some of them laughed. They said, the Bible imagines that this is a flat earth. So everybody's just going to look up and see him. What a joke, you Christians. You're so dumb, right? How foolish of you to think that, that the earth is flat and every eye shall see them. Today, I have this device upon my hip. I live on a round earth. And if there's anything of any significance whatsoever, I get a notification upon this device, which automatically has me press on that notification, and it will be referenced, and I will see it happening in real time. That wasn't present when I was a kid. That wasn't present when I was a young adult. But it's present now. And it's not only present here in an influential country like America. It's present over in in the the desert, in in Africa. Even the the, the poor of the poor have this type of device that they can look up and ever I shall see him when he returns. (laughs) Do you not realize how close we are and how how much importance should be given to us telling people about this knowledge of this Messiah that is to come. Daniel even prophesied this knowledge that would increase at the end times. And Daniel, he said knowledge will increase at the time of the end. And you know what? It certainly has increased. The sum of man's total of knowledge up to 1845, if we were looking at it according to one person, said it would be about an inch how much knowledge went. From, from the time of Christ, or even from the time of Daniel, up to 1845. It moved about an inch. Well, then he said, up to 1845 to 1945, whew, we got up to three inches. Okay, so there was an increase, definitely an increase. He went on to say, from 1945 to 1976, you might as well go up to the top of the Washington Monument, because that's the increase of knowledge that's occurred. What happened in 1970s? The computer came in and the Internet we up in the skies now, okay, in the increase of knowledge that has taken place. Folks, do you not realize that you better get yourselves ready because the Messiah is coming back, okay? <laughs> He's coming back. Yet today, many use the Internet to watch funny cat videos and to understand who the Messiah is, okay? That, that's the mindset. That's the mindset. The promised one to come is the most important knowledge ever. It would help if we knew more about Messiah because he's all over this book which we study from each Sunday. It's all over it. 
You may have thought this book was just a book of rules, right? Many people think that. It's just a book of old rules. Some people think it's just a bunch of old stories, but it has one central theme. That's the promised one. But there are other books, other ancient books, that mention him as well. For example, the Talmud. That's the teachings of the Pharisees back during that time. Uh, it was the central text of rabbinic Judaism and the primary source of all the Jewish religious laws. You know how they add on all those different laws? Well, that's found within the Talmud. But even within the Talmud, the old, uh, the old Sanhedrin, they wrote things about this Messiah because they were very fascinated about him. One uh, guy in the Talmud said all the prophets prophesied only of the days of the Messiah. So he was saying all our Old Testament, it's all about the Messiah, right? The Sanhedrin, and that's in Sanhedrin 99a. In Sanhedrin 98b, it says the world was not created but only for the Messiah. So they referenced the Messiah over and over again. You know, in, in Jewish circles today, they're not so much concerned about the Messiah anymore, are they? Why is that? Because they rejected him a long, long time ago, right? A long time ago. The first mention of him is in, uh, in Genesis. From the very moment of creation, from the very moment that mankind fell into sin and it crashed upon all the world. See, God created the world in six literal days. People try to roll around that. They want to say it's billions and billions of years. I tell you what, God created everything here fully formed over six literal days. And it wasn't that long ago from what I understand from the Scripture. I can't tell you the exact date. You know why I can't tell you the exact date? Because the Bible don't give you the exact date. All right? You don't have to know everything. You don't have to know everything. But he created everything, and he created it good, but he also created it free. Everybody has the freedom to choose whether they're going to go into sin or they're going to go into righteousness, whether they're going to follow God or they're not. But this is what happened to the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve. Uh, they chose to reject uh, God by doing the one thing he asked them not to do. How many of y'all ever done that in your lives? Somebody told you, whatever you do, do not touch that book. Mm, I won't touch that book, don't you? It's in our nature, right? Just, and it was just the same in Adam and Eve's nature. They were told not to eat from the tree of knowledge. The tree of knowledge. Say, so what's wrong with knowledge, Scott? What's wrong with knowledge, Pastor? Well, there's something, some things we don't need to know. You realize that? We live in the day and age where everybody thinks they need to know about everything, right? They need to experience everything around them. We need to know that. We don't need to know how many beers it'll take to get us drunk, do we? When I was a young kid, they'd sit around and they'd talk about, well, how many beers would it take to get you drunk? I noticed the ones that have been drinking a while, that took quite a few more, right? But I don't need to know that knowledge, do you? I don't need to know what it takes to get me into the sin of drunkenness, do you? I don't need to know what that experience feels like. I wish I had never felt that experience myself. Can I tell you that? I wish I had never felt that. I wish I had never experienced that because it was never anything I needed to know. You understand? We don't know, need to know what it's like to be sexually active outside of marriage. Do you know that? Do you know that? You don't need to know what that's like. You don't need to know what it's like to be with that woman or to be with that man. You don't need to know those type of things. You don't need to know all these different wild and crazy things that have evolved out of that today. You don't need that type of knowledge in your life. That type of knowledge will just destroy you, right? We don't need to know the best ways to scam people. You know that? We don't need to know the best way to... to uh, Take a buck off somebody else without them knowing about it. We don't need to know how to lie. We don't need to know how to cheat. We don't need to know these things. You know, there was a time when people would turn red in embarrassment over things, wouldn't they? People don't get embarrassed no more, do they? People don't turn red over things anymore. Not so much as they used to. Maybe it'd be better if they did. There's a lot of nonsense in this world that we just don't need to know. We don't need to have it in our minds. And the devil gave Adam and Eve the knowledge that they didn't need to know yet or ever. Can I tell you something? Just trust God. God's going to give you the knowledge that you need to have. God will provide what you need to understand. Go, go out trying to find this knowledge that will destroy you. 
that will beat you down and, and bring you in places that will hold on back in your mind for years to come. There are things in my mind I can't unsee. You understand? There are things in your mind you can't unsee and you can't get rid of. Folks, don't take the bite of that tree of knowledge falsely so called, okay? Well, they took this knowledge and they did become ashamed at that time. And because of their sin, the world is cursed and future generations are cursed and we live in a sin-cursed world today, right? It's all around us. But God didn't leave them there. He cast uh, them out of that place so they wouldn't eat from the tree of life in order to give them what? A second chance. Aren't you glad God gives you a second chance? Ain't you glad God gives you a second chance? Yeah. Folks, I tell you what, sometimes I need third, fourth, and fifth chances, all right? Because I mess up. I make mistakes. But I'm so thankful that God gives us a second chance to take up, to put those old knowledge that we gained away from us and go in the right way. The curse that God placed upon the serpent here reveals the promise of a second chance. And I will put enmity, he says, to the snake between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is the first mention of the Messiah in all of the Scripture. This is where uh, God lays down what the rest of the Bible is going to be all about. And he's not just talking to some old sly snake in the grass. He's talking about to the sly snake in the grass. He's talking to the devil here. You understand? The scriptures tell us later on that he was that old snake that was in the garden, doesn't it? And this may be the beginning of most women's hatred of snakes. I don't know. You bring out a snake and uh, a lot of people get antsy. Even the men, right? Uh, this may be that. But actually it's the beginning of a much bigger conflict than that. Read what it says here. It says, her seed, right? And the serpent's seed. Seed meaning uh, those that will come out of them. Their family, who they are. There are only two different people groups in the world. People get all excited today. They say there's the blacks, there's the whites, there's the Asians, there's the uh, Hispanics, there's the, uh, this group and that group, right? All these different groups. They say, no, that's not what God sees at all, okay? God sees the lost and the saved. That's all he sees. From where he is, that's all there is. And everybody else just got a different skin tone or a few different uh, characteristics about them. Okay? There's only the lost and the saved. But what do they look like? You know, you can't look at them and say, well, they look of this type and they look of that type. You know lost people sit in church. Did you know that? There's some lost people sit in church all their life. And they're still lost. And there's some saved people are messed up and out here wandering around and ain't got enough sense to get themselves into church. Do you know that? It goes both ways. But the scripture gives us a pretty clear understanding of who they are. If you want to write down these verses, you can. 1 John 3.10, John gives us this description. He says, in this the children of God are manifest. You know what manifest means? It means clearly seen. In this, the children of God are clearly seen. And the children of the devil. You want to know the difference? This is it. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not a God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. He gives us two characteristics here, don't he? Somebody that's not living righteously. They haven't been changed by God's grace. Well, that's a good indicator. They don't know him, right? Right? And the second is this. He don't love the brethren don't love one another here within the church. I don't love my brother. I take care of myself. That's all I'm worried about is me, 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 right? So, so, so here, he says, is these two things of a description. Paul, later on, Acts 13, 10, he's talking to this sorcerer who comes in on the church and he's trying to cause trouble. He looks at him and says, Oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. Well, that tells us who he is, right? This sorcerer is a child of the devil. Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? What does a lost person do? They try to hinder other people from getting saved. 
The lost person within your home will always be saying, we don't need to be down there at that church house. We don't need to be uh, reading that Bible. We don't need to be uh, searching out for God. Do we have to do that all the time? They'll try to hinder people from coming to salvation because if you get saved, I might have to get saved, right? They'll try to hinder those things. You understand? So there you have it. The children of the devil and the children of God clearly manifest once again. What about Jesus himself? Jesus looked to the people that was religious leaders during that time in John 8, 44. He looked them square in the face and he said, Ye are of your father, the devil. Well, that tells us whose side they're on, right? They're of their father, the devil. And the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his loan for he is a liar and the father of it. He told the first lie in the garden, you go ahead and eat of this thing and everything's going to be all right, right? That's what he said. And his sons follow right after him. They're liars. If you're a liar... You're a child of the devil, okay? If that's your habit is to lie to people, you need to get on this altar this morning and receive Christ. Lying. You know, that's, a, that's probably the one thing that we don't think a thing about is telling a lie. Not being completely honest. A lot of people today do. A liar who will not let anyone get in his or her way of getting what he wants. He'll even murder you, right? If it comes down to it. Child of God and the child of the devil. Which one are you? So we hear here that there is this conflict between these two, right? And second here in Genesis uh, 3.15, we hear of her seed. Folks, that is so miraculous to me. Women don't have the seed. They receive the seed, if you understand what I mean, right? Women don't have that. This is a prophecy that there's going to be a virgin come and conceive on her own. Why? Because she'll bypass that old curse, that one coming in the world. He'll bypass being a son of Adam in that sense. He'll bypass that seed, and there'll be a virgin birth come about. This is in the very beginning. You think when Moses, and I believe Moses penned Genesis, you think when Moses wrote that down, he understood completely what he was writing down? I don't know. I don't know, but God did, didn't he? He got it down to us, didn't he? He got it down to us today to know that there will be a virgin birth from the very beginning of the Jewish scriptures that this Messiah would come born of a virgin. A miraculous way for him to come in the world. Finally this, one last thing. There's a promised victory. A promised victory. Now hear this now. The cross here was prophesied from the very beginning. And not only the cross, but the return of Christ as well. The return as well. Satan's seed, it says, shall hurt the heel of the woman's seed, but he shall bruise, destroy the serpent's head. What happens if a snake bites you on the leg? What do you do? You stomp that head, don't you? You hope there wasn't much venom in it, but you stomp that head, right? It hurts you a little if you've got the anti-venom or whatever, uh, whatever might be the case. It'll hurt you a little, but you're going to destroy that snake, right? And that's what he's saying is going to happen here. He's saying that when this seed comes upon the earth, born of the virgin, he's going to be hurt by the serpent's seed. He's going to be hurt by the devil's followers. And that's exactly what happened. Didn't he look at them Pharisees and say, Ye are your, you are of your father, the devil, right? The, fa- the sons of the devil got up there and they put him on that cross thinking they had destroyed him. You understand? Thinking that they had beat him down and they thought all was lost. Even the disciples thought all was lost. And then he rose again, didn't he? On the third day and come up from that grave, right? Right? The serpent's seed thought he had won, but he hadn't. You know, there's another seed that's coming too. It's called the Antichrist. And he'll come in those days that I'm telling you about when there's a mark of the beast when there is uh, all these different prophetic things, when Israel is back as a nation, when, when there's a temple for him to go set in and claim that he is God in Israel, that there are all these things are lining up in place for that serpent seed to arrive. But you know what happens when the serpent seed shows his mighty head? 
There's a greater head coming, right? There's a greater one coming in those days who will come back and he is finally going to take that old serpent, that old serpent, the devil, they're going to cast him off into a pit. There's going to be a reign of Christ for a thousand years. He's going to come back out and they're going to stomp his head down in the ground, right? And I'm going to be happy, ain't you? Because I ain't going to have to deal with that no more, right? He's going to stomp them. But he's also going to take out all the other sons of the devil. All the other daughters of the devil. Do you understand that? There's judgment coming upon this old world. You understand that's why we meet up here and why we go out here and we share the gospel with people because we want them to have life and that more abundantly and not death that will come when the Lord comes back, when He casts those sons of the devil into hell. You understand? Hell is real. Hell is a real place. People are going to go there. People are, most people are going to go there. They're going to open their eyes up in hell and flames just like the rich man did in the Scripture begging for a little water on the tip of their tongue. And hell ain't the worst part. He's going to take hell, he's going to take it, and he's going to drop it down into the lake of fire at the end. Forever and ever. The smoke of their torment rising up forever, it says. Do you realize how important it is that people know the Messiah? Do you realize how important it is? You know, the Scripture has an interesting way of talking about knowledge in the Bible. It says when Adam come to be with his wife and have children. He said he knew Eve, his wife. He had intimate relations with Eve, his wife. It's very possible for us to have the knowledge of the Messiah in our head and not know the Messiah in our heart. It's very possible to know all the different things but not have that intimate relationship with Him. Folks, the Bible says the devils believe and tremble all right they know here they know all the things i've just said they know what the scripture says the devil can quote scripture better than anybody else okay he knows it very very well he's had a very long time to memorize it all right he knows what it says but he don't know him and that's the thing do you know him here today Understand? This is the most important thing in the world. More important than what you want to watch on TV tonight. More important than what you're going to eat in a few minutes. More important than any of these other things that are going to fly by and be forgotten in the next thousand years. The Messiah is the most important thing in the history of the entire world. Are you ready to meet Him? Are you ready to meet Him here today? I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube, but I would love even more to meet with you in person at the church where I'm blessed to pastor at in White Pine, Tennessee, Omega Baptist Church. We are located directly off of Exit 4 off of Interstate 81 in Tennessee. You can see us clearly from the interstate. We have worship each Sunday at 1030 and I hope you'll make plans to join us.